I am thankful that I have all the body components that God gave me when I was born. I've never lost a finger or an eye. I may have lost a few teeth, but you know, it's amazing how the dentist can fix that these days and just make it where it'll last about as long as you will. I'm trying to remember if I've ever broken a bone. I don't think I have. When I was in about the fifth grade or so, I was running and a boy was taller than my, I am and my forehead broke his nose when we ran into one another, but I still feel bad about that, but I don't think I've ever broken anything. Everything in my body right now seems to be working pretty much the way it's supposed to be, except for the natural aging factor that we all experience. But I think about the body and how that God wants me to use this body for His glory, for His purposes. It's wonderful that I have it, and it's wonderful, and we're always thankful to God when everything is seemingly working the way it's supposed to be, and nobody likes to be sick. And isn't it wonderful when you're sick and you get better, the sore throat is healed, or or that broken bone heals, or maybe surgery is performed and something that was causing a problem was removed and you basically resume. It, it's just amazing what doctors can do. But why does God want us to have this body? Well, when you become a Christian, you become a member of Christ, don't you? All that you are, your mind, your body, your activities, everything belongs to God. When Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, the 1 Corinthians chapter 6, looking at verses 19 and 20, the context of the statements that he makes there have to do with improper behavior, immoral behavior, using one's body for, for sexual activity that is not uh, approved by the Lord. But there's a principle in verses 19 and 20 that can help us this morning. When he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who you have from God and you are not your own? So I don't belong to myself anymore. He says you were bought with a price. We know what the price was. It was indeed the blood of Christ who gave his body on the cross for our sins. He gave his body throughout his life, ultimately giving his body as a sacrifice for sin. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Someone said the problem with our today's living sacrifices is they continue to crawl off the altar. Well, there may be some humor in that, but that's a, we kind of have this tendency to run away from being sacrificed, don't we? It's not really the day for that, Lord, or it's not the time. Can I just be excused for No, no, no. You don't belong to yourself. That's kind of hard to accept sometimes, isn't it? I don't belong to me. Even Paul would help us as, as Christians in marriage. Our bodies don't belong to one another 100%. But in spiritual matters, I see that Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 as he concludes that great chapter on resurrection that we are to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So I move from the idea that the body doesn't belong to me or my mind for that matter and I'm not my own that I was bought with a price, that God has a purpose for using this body to be a living sacrifice. And Paul gets into some details when he says you're always abounding in the work of the Lord. I need to be reminded of that from time to time. Let's look at some different aspects of our bodies this morning. If you have a bulletin, the outline is inside. If you didn't get one, they're on the foyer table and Nobody's going to say anything if you want to go out there and get one. But I look at 
these particular passages, and I look at my body, and I think this lesson then is designed to help me to use my body and my life for the Lord. Present your tongue to the Lord. The tongue is such a powerful little member. James would help us understand its power in James chapter 3, wouldn't he? We would see in verses 9 and 10, speaking of the tongue, he says, With it we bless God and the Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. I see that my tongue can be used for good, or it can be used for evil. James would warn us in the first part of this chapter of not many of us being teachers because we will receive a stricter judgment. A man or a woman, depending on the situation, that would stand up and attempt to teach God's Word to women, to children, or other women, and men to other men or the church. What a grave responsibility that is. To stand up before God's people, seeking to present what God wants us to know and to understand. And I need to be very cautious when I prepare a lesson or write an article or even to teach someone in a one-on-one situation that I speak in a way that would please God. That I would say things that God would have me say. That I don't add to His Word, I don't take away from it. That I just speak it as God has given it to me, which requires study on my part, and that would help me not have a problem with judgment. But James goes on to say that we do stumble. And he's still talking about the tongue in verse 2. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect, or the idea is a mature man. And I've read this passage for a long time, and I used to think, well, you really can't perfect that tongue. I want to be careful that I don't excuse myself of becoming mature with the way I speak. I have known some people in the church for many years, and some of these people I have never heard them say anything that I could question. There aren't a lot of people like that, but there have been. That tells me at least when I'm around certain people, I can control that little member that James says is like a fire. It has the potential to produce poison, or it has the potential to produce sweetness. I think about my tongue being a part of my body, and I think about the way that I speak. Not only in my teaching, certainly I would not want to be guilty of saying one thing to you about my brethren, and then go somewhere else and say something negative about my brethren to somebody else. That's one of the reasons, and I believe that's part of it, that... A deacon is not to be double-tongued. In other words, he'll say one thing here, but something else somewhere else. I think in a Paul, in a kind way, said don't lie. But also, just the way that you speak, don't speak one way with one person and speak with someone else in a different way about people. It's very easy to talk about one another. James warns us that we don't do that. Because they too were made in what? The similitude of God. We're talking about God's people, God's family. But how do I speak to my brethren? Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Paul helps us with the way that we speak when he says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification or building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. It's so easy to be negative or to say things that are negative in nature or to begin to talk in even, even with corrupt language. Brethren, we should not use foul language. But I don't know that that's what Paul is limiting this to because he says you also speak that which is good for necessary edification. There are times when we need to be built up. We need encouragement. And it's very easy to to be negative or to bring up negative things. I I was talking with Brother Larry, if he doesn't mind me sharing this, but he and you all know that he a lot of times he's at home. 
He wants to go and he wants to do, but his health has him bound to that bed and he gets discouraged. Words of encouragement are, are needed at times like that. Everybody gets a little discouraged. So we need to use words that are good for it, necessary edification that it may impart grace that is help to the hearers. Now look at uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Colossians 4 and verse 6 helps me to realize that there are other ideas about this. And it's very similar, but let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. You know what got me into trouble in school more than anything? I didn't read that passage. And my teachers would say, you don't talk to me that way. And the principal would have to deal with that. And because I didn't season my speech with salt. I didn't speak with grace. If my dad had heard me be disrespectful to one of those teachers, the principal couldn't have, couldn't have done near what he would have done. But then we'd bring that idea. You know what caused that? That teenage attitude? You know what I'm talking about? Some people don't get rid of it. And sometimes I have to kind of bite my tongue, don't we all, to some degree. You want to say, you want to express, but you know that's not going to work. Because that's not with grace. That's not seasoned with salt. I need to learn how to answer each one, to, to, sac to present my tongue in such a way, number one, that I teach as God would have me teach, that I don't talk about my brethren, and I don't speak to my brethren in an unkind way. I teach the truth. I try to encourage my brethren when I speak to them, trying to use my tongue in a careful way. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath. You ever come into a situation where a person is just a little bit hot at the time, and they may be hot toward you, and the flames are coming out, and, and so you come back with your torch, as it were. No, no, no. A soft answer. Now does the Bible teach us that? Turns away wrath. And I've seen, I have seen people in marriage, for example, there's usually a stronger personality and a weaker personality. Not necessarily a stronger, weaker person, just the personality. The more outspoken one, more domineering one, and don't ask me which one is which in my family. But, it's very easy to, to strike out and then you've got this man. He's just so meek and so mild and he can tone that woman down or turn it around. This woman so meek and so mild, she can tone that man down because a soft answer turns away wrath. Present your tongue with teaching that's correct. Present your tongue that is encouraging. And present your tongue that's with grace and seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Present your hands. I think the human hand is one of the most amazing things. It's something, you know, I can see my feet, but they don't work like my hands. My hands can do a lot more than my feet. Now, I know some people who don't have any arms. And I've seen people, when I was at Freed Hardman way back, there was a young lady who could sit at the table and she didn't have any arms and she could feed herself with her feet. She had to learn how to do that. That was just an amazing thing to me because I could just simply pick up a fork and pick up the plate or take the spoon and fill up my plate with food or take my hands to the, to the machine and get the milk in the mornings. Or It's just amazing what you can do with your hands, isn't it? really is. You can write with them. You can reach virtually most places on your body that, that need to be because God gave these to help us. But James talks about having clean hands because the hands can be used for a lot of things that are not clean, that are improper. To present your hands as a living sacrifice. Notice James chapter 4 and verse 8 to, to purify or clean your hands. He says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, 
you double-minded. The hand can be used for so many evil things. But it also can be used for good things. To present my hands as holy hands. Pure hands. I think about the hands of my Lord. There are things that Jesus did that amaze me. They, they really do. Because I am just not like he is all too often. But here he is in John chapter 13. He's ready to go to, on trial for his life. To be tried, to be beaten nearly to death, and then ultimately crucified. And he's at the Passover meal with these 12 men, including Judas at this point. And they've come to the Passover and they haven't washed their feet. Jesus takes his hands and one by one washes the feet of those disciples. Knowing that it wouldn't be long till Peter would tell three times, I don't know him. That Judas would betray him by 30 pieces of silver, about a day's wages to betray his Lord. But Jesus washed their feet. Jesus had hands of service, but he had hands of service at the right time. There are times when people need our help. They need our hands. They need the service that we can give because Jesus fed the poor. 4,000, 5,000. He would put his hands on little children and, and bless them. I see the hands of my Lord. We need dedicated hands. Solomon would tell us in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. My daddy taught me that. Son, if you're going to do it, do it right. And if you do it wrong, do it over. And that's a good lesson. I've done a lot of things over because my dad said do it right or do it over. Whatever your hand finds to do, <clears throat> do it with your might. No, notice, we know that Solomon is talking more than just the hand itself. But what you put yourself to the task to do, do it right, do it well. But I think about the Lord's hands ultimately in John chapter 20. You remember that when Jesus was first, first presenting himself to his disciples after the resurrection, Thomas was not there. And we see in verse 24 of John 20, Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them came, Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Now Jesus has died. He's been resurrected. But the scars from his crucifixion are still visible in his resurrected body. I don't believe, brethren, that the nails went through the palm. It's been scientifically proven that a cruci man crucified, though that would not hold him to a cross. It, it would probably have been behind the wrist and the Jews would consider that all of the hand, maybe from here forward and so he's got to show him this. And look, Thomas, what did Jesus do with those hands? He gave his life, proof that I did. When I think about this and I look at my, my life that I present, my tongue, I present my hands that are hands of service. And there are people that need what I can do in service, they need my help. I may not be able to, I may not think I can help, but do what I can, what I am able with what God has given me. You may only have one hand. If that's all you have, you may have no hands. We know that God still knows that we can still be used. Present your ears. How many of you grew up with your parents saying, Are you listening? 
And, and when my daddy would say, did you hear me? He wasn't asking me about the physical anatomy of my, my little ear here. Are you listening, son? Are you paying attention? And my ears should always be open to hear the Lord. I may not hear everybody else, but I need to hear Him. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration that Moses and Elijah appeared and there's Peter, James, and John and Peter wants to build a tabernacle for everybody and then, then Moses and Elijah are gone and what did the Father say? This is my beloved Son, hear ye King James Version says, hear ye Him. Listen to Him. What was it that Peter said to Jesus in John chapter 6 after everybody went away. To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. I need to have ears open to the words of my Lord. Jesus would say in John 10 verse 27, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. That hearing takes me to listen to the Lord. Not only to listen, but Jesus said, they, I know you, I know my sheep. And the reason that he does is because they follow him. So my listening takes me to a, to a following. Should always be open with my ears to the words of the master. But also be open to the concerns of others. There are a lot of things that we hear in life that raise concern. You hear a baby cry, and he cries a lot. Something is wrong. A mother cries. And, and Eli knew something was wrong with Hannah. Hannah was crying at the, at the temple, at the tabernacle rather. And, and what's wrong, Hannah? Because he heard her cry and his Bad a father as Eli was, he did have concern for Hannah's need. He heard her cries. And I hear people cry. And I know there are people who are, who are in need. They cry out for this. They cry out for that. And I can do one of two things. I can turn it off. I can do as the priest and the Levite and see a man who may have been moaning on the side of the road after being beaten and left for dead. And I could just keep walking, or I could do as a Samaritan. Maybe the man was groaning. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But there was a man in need. So this Samaritan, with his heart, with his eyes, with his hands, with his ears, met the needs of a man who was left for dead. There are people who are crying out for help. They need our help. And you know, when you read that story the way the Lord presented it, that Samaritan was that man's hope. What if he'd have kept walking? He probably would have died. People are in need of our help. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 15, rather. Matthew 15, beginning with verse 21. Jesus went out from there to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Here's a woman who's crying out. Her daughter is, is severely suffering from demon possession. It occurred then. It doesn't occur today, but it did then. And, and it was causing a major physical problem and no doubt mental problem. And Jesus said in verse 26, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Now there's much to this story that we could delve into in a deeper fashion. This woman was not of Israel. Jesus at this time was 
ministering to the Jewish people because of God's plan to go to them first. This woman is a Canaanite. She's a Gentile. But she had faith. And she cried out to the Lord for help. And I think as, as I go through life, I hear people who may be crying out for help. And one of the things I learned from this is my Lord took time to investigate the situation to help her to help her evaluate herself. We know that the Lord knew that the woman was sincere. But this is given to us to let us know there's some people who cry out for help that really do believe in the Lord. And they really do want our help. May I be careful not to walk past the people who are crying out for help. You never know what they're really seeking. It may be the Lord Himself, and you may be their only link. I need ears that hear the cries of the needy and the poor. In Proverbs 21, 13, the writer says, Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. There indeed are people who need our ears. You remember when Jesus gave the parable of the soils or the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8 that there were three different kinds of soil that that the seed fell on. There was the, the ground where the birds would come and consume the seed when the sower went forth to sow. Then there was seed that was seed that fell on the rocky ground. It sprang up for a little while because the Soil was shallow. That hot Palestinian sun would burn down and dry it up and the plant would wither after it germinated. Then there was the seed that fell on the thorny ground and the thorns and the cares of life choked out the word. But then you have those who had good ears. Good hearing. And that's brought to our attention in Luke chapter 8 and verse 8. The scripture tells us, Others fell on the good ground. It sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, Jesus cried out, that is, with a loud voice, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen to what I'm telling you. This seed is important. Some of it's going to fall and the devil's going to remove it from your heart. Some of it's going to fall and and because your faith is shallow, it's not going to survive. And some of you are going to choke out the word because all you care about are things in this life. But those who have good ground, you hear, listen. I need to listen with my ears and hear what the Lord would have to say. I also need... Not only to present my tongue in a proper way, but then to use my mouth for the Lord. There are a lot of ways we can communicate, aren't there? You can send out an email, you can send a text message, you can, uh, you can write a letter. Uh, if, if you can't even speak, you can do those things. People who can't speak learn how to write and to communicate. Even people who are deaf and and mute can learn to communicate. But there's one thing I know, regardless of the condition of my body, to the best of my ability, God wants a message communicated to people, and it's a saving message. It's a message that will save the souls of, of men and women. You remember when Jesus sent the disciples out in Matthew chapter 10 on what we call the limited commission. And he tells them in verse 22 of Matthew 10, You'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. But he says down there in verse 27, still speaking of the need to go out and spread the message to, at least at this point, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Whatever I tell you in the dark, you speak in the light. And I'm envisioning the Lord and His disciples in a room somewhere. Maybe the lighting's not so good. and Just sitting there talking about spiritual matters. Don't you think that would have been a wonderful experience? To sit there and listen to Jesus Himself. He says, but, but now listen, whatever we've been talking about over here alone, I want it out for everybody. And what I tell you in secret, I want it to be preached from the housetops. Whether Jesus literally meant for people to stand on the roof of the house and preach or if he was using hyperbole, the point is he wants the message gotten out. 
I have never seen the Bible preach itself. I've never seen the words just jump off the page and preach themselves. And I know that sounds a bit comical, but it's not going to happen, is it? God has always used human beings to execute His commands. He's always used, He used the voices of the prophets. He used the voice of John. He used the voice of His own Son, who in turn taught His disciples to go and tell people, What I've told you, I want people to know. I want them to hear. I want you to use your mouth as a living sacrifice. I want people to know that the gospel is indeed the power that I have for salvation, Romans 1.16. It is for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so the message needs to be spread. Jesus speaks from the book, but the book says to speak. He's there, but He wants us to spread it. He wants us to share, to preach the word. Paul would tell Timothy, who lived in the capital of Asia Minor in Ephesus, beginning with 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, I charge you in the sight of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Well, how do you want me to preach it, Paul? I want you to be urgent or instant in season and out of season. Well, how do you want me to preach it, Paul? I want you to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And, and, and how long do I do it? He says, well, you do it with long suffering, so however long it takes. I want you to preach the Word, Timothy. I want people to know what God has given me the commission to share with you, to teach you to be a preacher, to teach. Does the world need the Gospel? When we preach the Word, the Word changes people. It's powerful. The Hebrews writer tells us it is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it will take and cut you inside out, but it will open you up and let you see who you are, who you're not, and how you ought to be. But the Bible is not going to teach itself. Does the world need what we have to say with regard to God's will? It might be one sentence in a moment of time. It might be two hours with nothing else to do but sit and talk. But our mouth should be a sacrifice for the Lord because Paul tells us in that same chapter in 2 Timothy 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears according to their own desires will heap to themselves teachers. And so we know that people, some people aren't going to listen. Well, does that cancel out the first couple of verses that Paul gave in 2 Timothy 4? No, no. He's saying, preach that so maybe there won't be so many of those people that will have those itching ears. I believe a lot of people are led astray because they've just never heard any different. A lot of people are led astray because they like it that way. Some people are genuinely rebellious. That does not change the power of the word. It does not change the power or the need to share it. Then we need to present our feet. When I was in Carrollton, Georgia last month, uh, it was the Monday that I came back after being in Alabama. I was in my motel room and I went out to get some coffee because the coffee in the room is just not, I don't know what it is, but the other stuff's a lot better. And you see people down there getting their breakfast. Well, there were three people out in the hallway of that motel and there was a lady in a wheelchair washing windows. She could only reach so high. That's high she could go. She she couldn't use her feet. She's in a wheelchair. There was another young man there with her, and I believe he had Down syndrome, and then there was another young lady there. And the three of them, because of that, I believe the one woman who, who, if she could have stood up, she could have done all that by herself. But she couldn't. But you see this team of people washing windows. Don't tell me people can't work that want to. They can. But I'm thinking about her feet and how she couldn't use them, but she did what she could. I'm thankful for my feet, my legs. I know as we get older, we lose some of that. That's normal. And I know some of you struggle with it. But really and truly, when I read Romans chapter 10, verse 15, where Paul talks about the beautiful feet of those who proclaim good news, the gospel, 
I know he's talking about that you gotta, gotta get up and move from point A to point B to point C to take your feet and go. They're beautiful, beautiful feet. Some feet, according to Romans chapter 1, they run to do evil. And Solomon reminded his son, stay away from those folks, son. They're running to do evil. They'll get you into trouble. But my feet can also be used to do good. To share the gospel message, to make sure I go. I think often of Philip in Acts chapter 8, running after that eunuch. Now I know the eunuch was in the chariot, and I don't know how fast the chariot moved. But all I know is that he ran to catch him, and if he hadn't have, the eunuch would have gone on not knowing what he needed to know. And there was a man sitting there reading the scriptures. I know in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, that father, when he saw that son at a distance, he ran, he ran to meet him, and it was not proper for a Jewish man to run in public. God says there are times you run anyway. To run to people with the gospel. To run to those who want to be restored. And here comes that boy and the father runs out to meet him. The traditional story of a man by the name of Phippides. He lived from 530 B.C. to 490 B.C. And he was what they call a professional running courier. And he ran... uh, when, uh, when, the requ- when Sparta requested help near Marathon to, to, from, to help with the Persians when they landed at Marathon, Greece, this man, Phippides, ran 150 miles. Now you talk about a runner. In two days. That's 75 miles a day. Now that's a lot of running. No doubt he had much experience with that. Then he runs that 25 miles from, from the battlefield near Marathon to Athens. And that's where you get a marathon from. It's approximately 25 miles. He ran with the words, we have won. Can you imagine what his feet looked like? Can you imagine his feet perhaps being cut and bruised and bloody and swollen and and when he got, finally got to the end of that run, he collapsed and died. At least that's the way the story was told. I would to God that we had feet like that. That we would run with good news to let people know. Let me tell you who wins. You want the best conclusion for Revelation? Two words. We win. And that's the ultimate conclusion, whether we understand the rest of Revelation or not. And that's why the writer begins up front. John, Jesus has John to communicate with those churches. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Present your tongue, present your hands, present your ears, present your mouth, present your feet, present your body a living sacrifice. To your God. You may be here this morning. And you've not been doing that. Your life is not in line with the will of God. You've not been following the master. You've not been listening to the master. And consequently you're not walking with him any longer. Jesus has been waiting all along. He's not gone anywhere. You may be here and you've never obeyed the gospel. You never put your Lord on in baptism to have your sins washed away by the precious blood of Jesus. Now we call people to respond, but we do it in the name of our Lord. And if you need to, the opportunity is yours now as we stand and as we sing. Who at the door is standing, patiently drawn.